much for being here and uh, for also watching via live stream. Uh, I'm joined here by two very distinguished guests. Sarah Sewell, U.S. Undersecretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, and Macon Phillips, Coordinator for the Bureau of International Information Programs at the State Department. And we're going to be talking about using data and digital tools for advancing foreign policy, security, and human rights. Um, so before we start, I would like to remind everyone to continue tweeting us your questions, um, and I will try to get some on stage if we do have time. Um, so I'd love to start out with, um, you know, each of, you, each of you telling me, you know, what more about your roles at the State Department and, you know, how you're using tech and data. Let's start with the Undersecretary. Great. Well, thanks, Matt. I want to say thanks for being here. Thank you to Mashable and the UN Foundation for hosting this event. It's really great to be able to talk a little bit outside of the State Department about what we do. Um, as the Undersecretary for Civilian Security, I am the leader of seven offices and bureaus that were put together fairly recently in uh, bureaucracy land. And they combine hard security with what we think of as the softer side or the value side of government. And so within my undersecretariat, we've got bureaus that cover counterterrorism, that cover counter drug work, that do uh, international law enforcement on the hard side. And then there are, is the Bureau of Democracy, Bureau that does refugee protection, Bureau that does anti-trafficking work, Bureau that does conflict prevention on the softer side. What I love about my job is that I see these as, as mutually reinforcing tools and policies that when they come together can really provide a strong foundation for civilian security. And what we are doing in the context of our new undersecretariat is really focusing on foreign policy through the eyes of people around the world. A lot of what the State Department does is government to government. That's traditional diplomacy and foreign policy. We really think of our set of issues as requiring the lens of the citizen, the global citizen. And so um, through that lens, I'm really trying to focus our team on prevention, prevention of violence against civilians, prevention of the spread of violent extremism. That's what we're really focused on. To do that and to communicate with people around the globe, we absolutely rely on technology. And I am not a technology expert, and I'm really eager to get some great ideas today from people who are. But essentially, what we're trying to do through this undersecretariat known as Jay is a rewiring of US foreign policy to really reach out to people and to strengthen the freedoms and the rights of individuals and the strength of communities as we pursue our broader foreign policy objectives. So delighted to be here today. Great. Yeah. So I'll just pick up where the Undersecretary left off. And again, uh, very uh, uh, thankful for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I uh, work in a bureau called the Bureau of International Information Programs, which I think has the most Orwellian uh, name of any of the parts of the State Department. Um, but uh, we, if, if you can sort of think about uh, how we just described um, what we call uh, J at the State Department, we're the implementer. Uh, of a lot of these ideas in terms of how we actually communicate with people uh, in a world where they're ever more powerful, where they're ever more part of uh, not just the uh, conversation, but actually the execution of a lot of these uh, strategies, a lot of these ideas that we talk about here in Washington. Um, and so our bureau used to be part of the U.S. Information Agency, uh, which was uh, moved in part into the State Department a while back, but had historically been about telling America's story and really um, explaining America to the world. Um, and that uh, was a world that's very different than the world we've, the one we find ourselves in. Um, what we've tried to uh, uh, begin uh, since I arrived at State is shifting us into a bureau that connects people with policy and looks at how we can use information, use communications, not simply to explain our policy uh, to people, but to actually uh, collaborate with them uh, in the implementation of that policy. Uh, so it's a tremendously exciting thing. It certainly uh, plays into my background, first uh, as part of the presidential campaign in 08 and then at the White House. Uh, I've been able to bring a perspective that's primarily uh, domestic to a bureau that's teaching me as much as I'm uh, helping out probably a lot more about the rest of the world. Um, but it's uh, a very exciting time to be at state. It's certainly, I think, a, a season of change uh, in terms of how we're grappling with this new world we find ourselves in. Um, 
and uh, excited to talk to you about it. Now I get to be like a real host with a real microphone. Um, so just moving back to you, Undersecretary, um, what are some specific examples of you know, using data and technology within your Undersecretariat? Well, there are a lot. So when I think about the prevention goals that we have, preventing violent extremism, for example, and I think about the ways in which we're, we're trying to empower communities to be more resistant to the kinds of lies and nihilism that come from outside, but also address some of the underlying push factors, you see that, that, that the self-identification of communities itself is one forum in which technology can be incredibly helpful. Um, and when we think about what it means to drown out moderate voices with the, the basically hijacking of social media by violent extremist voices and the terrorist message, you know, the big challenge there is to, to re-elevate mainstream religious voices, to re-elevate um, critical thinking, to re-elevate uh, comparative analysis of messages for people, to empower people to make their own informed choices rather than have them simply be subject to a massive barrage of propaganda. And so, so a lot of what we do is implemented, in fact, by Macon and his team, but things like tech camps, things like teaching people how to use social media to tell a story, whether it's about a victim of terrorism or whether it's about a returnee who's become disillusioned with the fight, or thinking about ways to help citizens feel more connected to governments so that they, they don't feel like the, the terrorist message is one that they can tolerate and hear. And that gets into some good governance issues that I'd love to talk about, but I'll stop there for now. But there are, there are a host of ways in which technology is part of the, the next stage of the fight against terrorism, which was to be more preventive and get ahead of the curve to help people protect their sons, their daughters, their communities from being essentially penetrated by terror networks. And I'm curious, um, you know, given the refugee situation currently that is so timely and, um, you know, very dire, uh, in what ways uh, is your office, you know, using data and technology to either track or help them? Well, so a, a lot of folks will be familiar. I mean, a lot of the tools that we use are not necessarily particularly novel, sorry, particularly novel or uh, sophisticated tools, but nonetheless, they're extremely helpful for the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So for example, we can't be in every refugee camp at every point in time, but technology can help us see what is going on in the camps and communicate with the camps. I was just in uh, Kenya with Secretary Kerry, and he communicated via Skype with a bunch of students from the Dadaab refugee camp there. So technology keeps us connected and, and allows us to have visibility interaction with places that we might not otherwise be able to engage with regularly. On the flip <coughs> side of that, we use technology in a virtual way with people who are returning to the states through a, a refugee resettlement program. And they, they can use virtual tools to begin to acclimate themselves both to the specific administrative demands of refugee resettlement processes but also cultural awareness and how to, how to acclimate themselves to the new environment here that they find themselves in. So technology can work at both, both ends of the refugee equation. And going to you, Coordinator Phillips, you know, uh, based on some of the examples that uh, the Undersecretary just gave, um, you know, how does your team, you know, what are, what are some examples of digital initiatives and strategies that your team comes up with to really bolster those initiatives? So, uh, there's a, there's a few, but I think one of the, the example that I want to use here is a reminder that um, you know, Mashable's known for always being on the, the cutting edge of the latest and greatest technologies. Um, but sometimes uh, sort of starting with first principles um, and from a digital standpoint um, uh, is, is the most important thing rather than using the latest tool. Um, and we were talking about this event ahead of time, and I was trying to put my finger on one that really captured that, and we landed on some work we've been doing in Nigeria, um, where we basically built an email list. And uh, the, the idea was we had an exchange program, 500 young people come to the United States uh, to spend six weeks uh, here, and then they have an event with the president. Turns out if you advertise that online in Africa, targeting 25 to 35 year old young leaders, there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, and so you get more than 500 applications. Uh, so we have 40,000 applications. And we use that to build a virtual network on top of a traditional exchange program that we then message to on a regular basis. We have online classes, all sorts of things that we do. It's called the Yali Network, yali.state.gov. You can look it up. <laughs> but where it started to intersect with some of the things the undersecretary talked about was when we were worried about the Nigerian elections. 
worried about uh, violence around those elections. We were able to segment a part of that email list uh, and talk to that community uh, about the issue of violence in elections ahead of time. And by the way, it wasn't just uh, uh, people in suits from the United States piping in. We were able to find leaders in that network who could talk to other members of the network and other parts of that community about these issues, about other elections in parts of Africa where they had grappled with similar issues. Uh, and we were also able to move content like a video message for the president and other types of things in a much more efficient way than we would have uh, prior. So just having an email network uh, in, in countries like Nigeria was hugely helpful for us in terms of addressing uh, what was a very concerning issue uh, for us and what ended up being, uh, I think, a pretty good uh, outcome. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's always important to think about the new technologies, and, and we certainly do. Um, but one of the, uh, I think, challenges as we look at the rest of the world is sometimes they've skipped a lot of legacy technologies and now they're using the latest and greatest things. But sometimes things just as basic as an email network uh, can actually be um, uh, the right tool at the right time. And when we were talking about you know, this panel earlier, you had mentioned something about you know, these tools can make jobs easier, you, especially <laughs> within the State Department, right. um, which I find fascinating. So can you kind of expand on that and talk about the specific ways that it does? Well, I should just come out and admit that we've rolled out Slack in our bureau. I am now part of the legion of Slack uh, acolytes, I guess. Um, and it's just a really fun thing to see happen because uh, the tendency of the State Department is to roll it out for a bureau, something with an acronym. But then once people start hearing about it, they start asking if they get an account. So now we've got a number of people from other parts of the bureau that are using this messaging app. And it's, it's super helpful, particularly when you're uh, in the field and on mobile and you need to be able to talk to people in real time about stuff. So that's, that's one easy one. Um, but one of the other uh, things that uh, we have started using technology for is trying to understand influence in countries where, I think to the Undersecretary's point, you don't have the kind of media environment that we oftentimes, I think, take for granted here in the United States, where you have a, sometimes a pretty repressive media environment that's been either state controlled or highly influenced, and you have this insurgent uh, digital media space that's trying to talk about it, whether that's through the diaspora or in that country. Um, we're able to use tools to identify who those actors are. Um, tools that give us data that is very similar to the data that Mashable uses to make its case about why it's relevant. Uh, when it was sort of originally seen as a place to talk about technology and gadgets, it's increasingly an influential website uh, and can demonstrate that. We're trying to understand how that correlates to uh, other countries in the world. Um, but not look at, it, look at it merely as additive. So when you travel, you should meet with these people as well as your additional ones. But start to actually understand who is influential uh, in these countries and who isn't? And that's a very uh, a transformative question, I think, as we're uh, considering how we prioritize our outreach. Um, and you know, something that both of you have touched on that I find really interesting is you know, the, these high-tech solutions, they're not necessarily solutions. They're supposed to you know, help the initiatives that are really helping you know, human problems or helping solve human problems. And Undersecretary, you touched on it by saying you know, the, it's the hijacking of social media. That's one drawback. I'm wondering if you can talk more about the drawbacks of technology in general and why it's important to maintain focus on the fact that you know, it's, it's humans that we are trying to help. Well, sure. I mean, technology interacts with humans in ways that can be positive and negative. And you know, when we talk about trying to prevent mass atrocities, prevent widespread violence against civilians, part of the way um, perpetrators of violence mobilize is through hate speech and incitement, through social media, through 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 technology. And um, how else do you create a mass movement around emotion? And and how you how you counter it, you can also counter it through technology. So for example, things as simple as equipping people to use SMS to ask for UN peacekeepers in the DRC to come and help them when they have early warning that they're going to be attacked, um, that's a very concrete way in which technology facilitates protection. Um, when violence has already occurred, as was true with the Yazidi population, last year in the, in the Iraq context, you know, it was, it was SMS messaging to posts, to the post in Iraq or to the Office of Religious Freedom in Washington, and it was using Google Maps, 
with pin drops to show friends of the Yazidis where ISIL forces were and where Yazidi civilians were trapped so that they could, could, could provide that information to those who would ultimately protect them with military means. Monitoring social media at post to see where is the hate speech, where is the incitement, where are the networks that we can identify that are, pro, that are currently fomenting uh, this kind of sentiment and that could, be, could mobilize to actually use violence. We use all these kinds of tools now in, in a way that was not true a very short time ago and that has become, I wouldn't say routine, but increasingly common within the government in terms of how we connect to populations that are at risk, how we identify populations that can pose risks, and how we organize ourselves and work with communities to try to protect them. That is really novel. I mean, uh, working through communities and people rather than solely through governments, working on the prevention side, and using tools as far away as, a, as halfway across the globe to do that work, that's all really new and really exciting and really important partnership between a government and global citizens that has huge implications. And, you know, we have only five minutes left, so I have a final question for you both. I mean, we have so many people in the audience here and watching via live stream uh, from various industries, government, journalism, tech and development, and so on. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what, what do you want them to answer? You know, what, what are you still working on? What do you hope that they can answer and help you with uh, in, in the near future? It's a great question. So um, one of the interesting things is that the State Department did a tech challenge for atrocity prevention work, and a lot of people contributed ideas toward that. That was a great example of the ways in which we can partner with you all who have great ideas to help us fulfill our objectives. Where we currently, I think, really need a dose of input, and I hope people will tweet at me at civstate.gov, so you can tell I'm old. I don't know. I, this doesn't roll off my tongue. Um, but, but so the, the White House Summit on Violent Extremism held in February, the President, the Secretary of State, you know, tons of world leaders, tons of civil society leaders, the private sector, people having a conversation about terrorism that wasn't about killing people. It was affirmative and positive. It was about how do we get ahead of the curve of terrorism? How do we help people protect themselves, their communities, their children from terrorism? How do we all work together to get an integrated approach to this problem set? So we want to set up networks. We want to set up networks of youth, of of communities that are bound by religious affiliation, of cities, uh, lots of different networks. How do we best do that? What do we do? What do you, how do you keep a network alive? How do you translate a network into action? Those are all things that we could really use help with. How do you, how do you create fresh content that, that, is, that can attract as much attention as the really awful violent content that seems to attract a lot of attention, where you have a very different message that's much more tolerant, that's much more uh, constructive? How do you keep how do you keep tolerance fresh? Those are, those are the kinds of issues that we really do need help with because we know that technology and networks of people connected by technology is absolutely vital to answering a lot of the really important global challenges. But we are struggling and trying to innovate and trying to learn in taking that on, and we really need help. So that would be great. Go ahead. Um. I want to uh, bring up an issue that um, the undersecretary mentioned at the beginning, which is um, not a, we're not going to end this, I think, on a high note. Um, it's what we're seeing uh, in the information space, again, in, in places other than the United States, which has a, you know, uh, for all of its uh, ups and downs, a really healthy, open society. And, uh, being here at the museum, it's sort of easy to, I guess, put that in context of what, how, how we enjoy the freedom of speech. There is a very well-financed, highly effective, and quite cynical war on information happening in other parts uh, of the world. Um, and I very much view it as salting the earth. Because the goal isn't to influence people about a different point of view. It's, about to make, it's, it's, it's meant to make uh, people think that what they see in news and what they see online and what they see uh, reported is all PR spin of some type. It's a war on truth. And 
looking at the agenda today and knowing many of you and the work that you do, you're, you want to plant seeds that are going to grow to be amazing ideas. But if the earth is salted, it's not going to grow. Um, and so I'm, I'm heading out to Riga and Latvia uh, on sa Saturday, Sunday, uh, and then on to Kiev, uh, and then on to Prague to try to figure out how the United States can best support training of investigative journalists, how we can make sure that our viewpoint is clear to the audiences that matter, how we can connect, and particularly the Czech Republic, a generation of young people who didn't live through the same thing that their parents lived through, don't understand the history of this problem, but it is an answer that is much bigger than the State Department. And in fact, I think the innovation required to bring uh, uh, the kind of honest dialogue we need around some very serious issues in terms of national autonomy and, and human rights, uh, we, we need help. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very scary thing to look at. Um, so for those of you that are interested in all sorts of angles of attack on this problem, be it sorting out information, be it training, you know, we'll put you on a plane and send you somewhere to teach people something. We'll look at your technology and see if we can help you implement it. And we're very eager to actually operationalize some of these things. I could just use um, some help thinking creatively about how to address this issue. Uh, and you can reach me at Macon44. And I will send you the undersecretary as well, uh, if you need to. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't mean to end it on a, a low note, but you know, I think I can speak for the undersecretary. When I, we took this job because we want to help address some problems. And uh, this is one that I, I certainly uh, think about a lot. Thank you. I think that's a very salient point to end on. Thank you both for being here. Thank you all for being here. Continue tweeting with the hashtag Digital Beltway and tweeting at our panelists. Thank you so much.